Hello and welcome to the fourth part of this webcast lecture about Karl Marx, where we're continuing the discussion of Marx's concept of the proletariat and its role within history. So the proletariat is a new force in the 19th century. It's a class with the most revolutionary potential. They have nothing to lose but their chains. The poor had always been a factor in history. Poor peasants in the past uh, did have something to lose. They had their position in the feudal hierarchy, including a right to poor relief. They were a valued part of the parish within the ideology of feudalism. Um, uh, they, they, ha they had a, a type of security uh, within the Christian ideology, um, the, where, where Jesus is the Lord, the feudal Lord. Everybody has a role within that system. Everybody has some value. Now Marx is saying all that is gone with the abolition of feudalism, with the rise of liberalism, free trade, feudalism, um, capitalism, then uh, all that's gone. And all the former peasants have is worthless constitutional rights, such as the right to own property, but they, they have none increasingly, particularly in England, where uh, pe uh, the peasantry was almost entirely cleared off the land to create uh, bourgeois, capitalist, uh, industrial farming. That was less true in other parts of Europe. Peasants managed to, to hang on. Uh, heavily armed, it has to be said, with their sickles and pikes and and things. Uh, the attempts of the liberals to take that land off them. Um, but nevertheless, um, and, and, and for that reason, the persistence of the peasantry in France and uh, especially Russia, of course, but also in Germany, probably slowed the process of capitalist economic development. But uh, in England, really, after the Highland Clearances, um, there were no peasants to speak of at all in England. And uh, that's something we discussed before. It's reflecting very much in the very, very horrible food culture of uh, England. One, one good thing about peasants is they do uh, like to take their time producing the food, and it's often much nicer. But anyway, that's a bit of a digression. So here we have the proletariat, um, they they have these uh, legal rights. Uh, even towards the end of the century, they're granted the vote, but these rights are not effective because they have no access to the means of production. And this is the key idea for Karl Marx. We need to get our head round this, what he means by the means of production. Um, this is a special type of property that is used to create property. So a factory, for example... Well, the best example of all would be a machine tools factory. A factory that makes machinery. That's capital. It's very, very different from private property. And again, it's often held against Marx that he, he wanted to do this ridiculous utopian idea where there would be no property at all. Property is theft. That phrase is often attributed to Marx. That's not right. That was Proudhon, who was a much more extreme thinker than Marx. Not all property is theft. Private property that one uses in one's own life is not the same type of thing as capital or the means of production. So um, a farm that is used to produce food, not for your own use, but for sale, that is the means of production, that is capital. A factory uh, which is used to make commodities not for one's own consumption, but simply for sale in order to make money, in order to invest in similar factories, that is capital. Uh, a bank that produces money in order to finance those factories is also capital. So this is the means of production. Capitalist society, put very simply, is a very simple idea to understand in these terms. It's where the means of production are now owned by private individuals, by private bourgeois. In feudal society, those means of production, the factories such as they were, um, that they would normally be thought of as guilds in the towns. Um, the, the, the farmland predominantly was owned by the state, was owned predominantly by the king or by aristocrats who held that land in the name of the king uh, by, by, uh, by feudal right, that they were granted lands in return, very often for political favours or conquest in war. So for Marx, the character of society is defined overwhelmingly by one thing, which is the relationship of classes to the means of production. Feudal society, the means of production are owned by the king, the state, 
um, and people have defined roles within the productive process. This is a very stable system. It lasted for centuries. Um, in a bad year, with famines, everybody starved, but probably everybody almost right up to the aristocrats had a bad time. In a good year, everything was good. Capitalist society is very different. Now, the ownership of the means of production is in private hands. The peasants are replaced, uh, ultimately, by a landless proletariat who can only sell their labour. There is no obligation on the part of the bourgeois to look after these people. Uh, the king has no role at all, except as a kind of ridiculous ceremonial figurehead, <clears throat> as Marx would see it anyway. Um, and so even the, and the whole state, the police force, the educational system, even the church uh, is a bourgeois church, which is there to consolidate the control, the private control of the means of production by the bourgeoisie. The philosophy and political philosophy that's characteristic of bourgeois society is of individual rights. The idea that anybody, you know, since they're granted the right to profit, property and they're granted the right to free speech and freedom of religion, anybody can uh, pull themselves up, as it were, by their own bootstraps and become bourgeois. They can set up a factory and um, they can become bourgeois themselves. I mean, that is largely a fantasy. If you look at the actual facts of the matter, that happens so infrequently that it's almost like a miracle when that happens. Most of the bourgeois, in fact, are former landed aristocrats, certainly in England, who break free from the restraint of uh, their obligations to the monarchy and the feudal state and establish themselves as owners of factories and mines and so on. Classic case is uh, Castlereagh's family, Lord Londonderry. They were feudal landowners. They'd been granted their lands in Ireland after the conquest of Ireland by the Tudor monarchy. And they'd simply, kind of like robber barons, been given this land. So they were landed aristocrats, but they found on this land, because they also owned land in the north of England, coal. Uh, and so they developed that coal mining and then factories and so on and converted themselves from feudal aristocrats into... Um, bourgeois into into capitalists who then demanded uh, the dissolution of the feudal obligations the feudal restrictions on trade uh, things like the corn laws things like um, tariffs and duties they wanted low taxation the free market and so on so that's much much more characteristic it's bourgeois ideology uh, Marx would say the idea that because everybody has these rights to property they can become capitalists that in practice that never happens at least in the 19th century society Marx was analysing, a later critique of Marx is that, in fact, ownership of capital became much more widespread in the 20th century because of reforms that Marx had not anticipated. For example, um, personal equity plans and the fact that lots and lots of people can own shares in companies now. And so there are the, that, um, that the bourgeoisie was no, is no longer a kind of tiny group cabal of super rich Lord Londonderry characters with top hats on, but that ownership of the uh, means of production is in fact widely spread through the City of London, through share ownership, through pension funds, and so on. There are contrary arguments about that from Marx's contemporary followers, and so the argument goes on. The same analysis of ownership of means of production in relation to class uh, also defines for Marx socialism. Socialism is not some weird uh, fantastic scheme uh, such as those put forward um, by uh, Fourier, Saint-Simon, the people that Marx criticised in the Communist Manifesto. And I think here Marx is certainly on very strong ground. And when everybody tries these sort of uh, communes and alternative societies, they always end in tears and frequently and sometimes turn into sort of cults like the Jonestown Massacre and so on. That was a, a, an avowedly utopian socialist project where they all went off into the jungle of South America in the 1970s. Uh, and then next thing we knew, they'd all killed themselves in a mass uh, suicide thing. So that's uh, socialism, utopian socialism. Scientific socialism for Marx is totally different. It's simply where the means of production are collectively owned, collectively owned by the state, which in Hegelian terms 
will act as a, a way of moving history forward and also of the proletariat dominating the bourgeoisie and eliminating the bourgeoisie as a class, not necessarily killing them, but uh, meaning that they're no longer constituted as a, as a factor in society. So the state must own the whole means of production, and that is socialism. It's also the case that under socialism, he says some enterprises could be cooperatively owned, that the people who worked in them could take ownership of them. But essentially, socialism is nothing more or less for Marx than the liquidation of the bourgeoisie as a class constituted as a political force.